In order to be a successful civil engineer, it's important that you're well-rounded and you can add value for your clients in a lot of different areas. And that's why in today's episode, we're gonna focus on grant funding. If you learn about grants and you're able to speak to your clients about them, maybe even help them obtain some of those grants, you will drive much more value for your clients. To discuss grant funding, I have with me today, Bill Mallon. Bill is a vice president, licensed professional engineer at Carroll Engineering Corporation. And he's gonna dive into this topic to help you be more well-rounded civil engineer. But first, a word from our sponsor. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. All right, now I would like to welcome our guest to the show for today, Bill Mallon. Bill is a licensed professional engineer. He's also a vice president with Carroll Engineering Corporation, where he manages their water and wastewater services group, as well as their grant solutions team leader. Bill, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Bill, just to kind of introduce yourself to our audience, maybe you could talk a little bit about your background in the field of municipal water and sewer authorities. So I've been doing um, municipal water and sewer authorities for 36 years uh, here at Carroll Engineering um, from a staff level up to um, client representation of um, municipal authorities as well as townships in Southeast Pennsylvania. That's great. And for our listeners who may not be familiar with municipal authorities, could you explain you know, what a municipal authority is and its role in kind of managing water and sewer systems? So a municipal authority is a, a separate um, governmental entity. It's um, created by um, an, an organizing municipality. So um, there are a lot of townships in Southeast Pennsylvania that in addition to the township government, they've separate re, re, separately recreated um, a water or sewer or both uh, authority. And so that municipal government supervisors, township council um, creates it. There's a, an, an act that the uh, authorities uh, work under um, and they're kind of separate and divorced from the day-to-day -day operations of the local municipality and, and are just really responsible for what they're tasked with, whether it's water or wastewater or both. So it kind of creates kind of an independent entity, even though it's a it's still a government kind of run organization, but it's independent from the actual typical regular government operations, Correct. I guess you yes. would say. The, the authority board members are um, appointed by the incorporating municipality, but beyond that, they generally operate independent. They've got their own budgets, mm -hmm. uh, their own professional consultants, um, their, their own financing. Okay, great. And so as an expert in this field, what type of services does your firm provide to municipal authorities? How does that relationship look? So we provide um, a full range of engineering services, um, capital planning, costing, um, design of projects, um, bidding services, construction administration, um, we also will provide uh, review services for new land development projects for the authority. Um, we uh, provide some financial assistance in doing um, uh, bond issues and, and borrowings. Um, borrowings are usually guaranteed by the local municipality. So we do um, basically a report that shows how the authority's debt is self-liquidating separate from any uh, township debt. And, mm. and so um, the township tax base isn't uh, impacted by the authorities borrowing. Um, we do uh, rate studies for them, assist them with budgets. Um, um, you know, pretty much uh, it's, it's not just the nuts and bolts of engineering, uh, the services that we provide. 
So Bill, just going a little deeper on that, if, if a uh, authority was to, you know, retain a consulting firm to provide these services, is it something where they, they send out an RFP or they have a contract specific and they would call you up? What is, g- give me an idea of how that looks. So um, our our appointment by authorities comes in different manners. Um, we have personal relationships and uh, with with um, authorities and representatives, and sometimes they'll just ask us uh, on as their consultant. Sometimes we respond to uh, usually a two step process of qualifications, so that they um, will weed down and select a few firms they feel are qualified to provide services to them, and then we'll sit down and and do an interview and they'll select what they think is the best um, based on qualifications and, you know, what they anticipate uh, their costs are going to be based on, you know, what our fees are. Okay. Okay. And, and I would imagine, you know, Bill mentioned Pennsylvania, you know, doing work there. And you know, obviously we have listeners all across the country. So I would imagine if this is something that interested you, you'd have to, you know, touch base with your specific authorities and your governing agencies, they may be a little bit different depending on the state or the jurisdiction that they're under and how they operate. Um, But I do know that a lot of consulting firms do work with municipalities, I mean, authorities, well, municipalities and authorities as a way to diversify their services a bit in terms of private, public, et cetera, um, from a risk perspective. So that's definitely something that can be a, a possibility. Bill, so grants play a significant role in funding infrastructure projects. Can you provide some insights into kind of the grant landscape for municipal authorities? I know you'll speak specifically to Pennsylvania, but I think just generally speaking, it'd be interesting to learn about how that works. So uh, yeah, in the last, um, I'd say half dozen years or so, there's been a significant amount of uh, grant money available in Pennsylvania. Um there are several funding sources. Some is just um, funding from the legislature and the state budget. Um, Pennsylvania has uh, casino gambling and uh, horse racing industries. And there are some specific grant programs that are funded uh, through them. Uh, gambling revenues are actually geared specifically towards the counties where casinos reside. So there's just individual programs for those counties. Uh, horse racing uh, and other revenue uh, is often statewide. Um, and uh, then lately with um, COVID-19 and ARPA funding through the federal government, there's a lot of funding that's been provided to states that's federal money that the states then manage um, through their grant programs as well. So with the, some of the some of the what would be traditional, um, state funded programs are now, at, at least in the short term, funded through uh, ARPA funds uh, coming through the federal government. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, as a consultant, as a civil engineer, as a consultant, you want to provide the most value to your clients possible. So one of the ways you could do that is to find out about the different grants that might be available to them they that they might not know about, right, and then bring that to their attention. Yeah, that is a, a big deal, um, and that's what created the uh, our grant solutions team because there were so many grant opportunities coming out um, that it, it was not really realistic for all of our client reps in the company to, uh, you know, research and know all of this. We put together uh, a group to, to basically do that for them and, um, you know, be able to target um, for the different types of programs, not just for authorities and water and sewer programs. There's traffic programs, roadway, transportation, stormwater uh, as well. So we, we handle all of that um, and kind of act as a clearinghouse for them. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, grant funding um, can be a big component, especially of small uh, municipalities. There are a lot of small boroughs in Pennsylvania, for example. Uh, with really limited tax bases and grant funds are um, their way of um, taking care of their capital needs. Yeah, for sure. And I've seen this across the country in different civil engineering firms that you'll see 
rant professionals, right? That's what they do pretty much on a day in and day out basis, just because it really can become a full-time job depending on, you know, the number of projects you're working on, the geographic regions that you're in, you know, like Bill mentioned, some states might have more funding or some counties may have more funding than others. So there can definitely be a lot of variables involved, but it certainly is a, a value add for clients as well. Bill, could you talk a little bit about the Department of Economic Development and Commonwealth Financing Authority grants? What what types of projects do these grants typically support and how can, again, municipal authorities kind of benefit from some of these? So um, the DCED, Department of Community and Economic Development, and the CFA was the Commonwealth Financing Authority. So the, the CFA is kind of an authority and kind of somewhat analogous to a uh, water and sewer authority. They're the ones that make the funding decisions, the actual who gets what money. DCD is, um, you know, they serve a huge role in Pennsylvania in guiding municipalities and, and authorities. And so their expertise is in um, kind of coming from the authority or the municipality end of things and, and knowing, um, what those entities do and how to um, get the grant money to them. Um, there are a variety of programs that become active from year to year um, for uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, some are smaller in size, maybe up to a half million dollar size project. Others can go up to $20 million in size project. Um, in addition to uh, water and wastewater, there's a lot for stormwater, for um, flood protection, um, stream improvements, parks and recreation. Um, you know, doesn't necessarily apply to water and wastewater uh, authorities, but there's a, a whole gamut of um, programs out there, um, and um, you know, for for money available for your needs. That's great. And so we've talked a lot about these grants. And obviously, when people hear the word grant, they get excited because it means money and, you know, getting money to their clients or their organization. Um, that being said, though, you know, what are some of the key considerations and, and challenges that municipal authorities face when applying for and managing these grants? Are there any specific requirements or kind of best practices that they should keep in mind? So not so much best practices. Um the key thing that I find is um, our, our clients aren't ready when grant opportunities arise. Mm. Um, there's usually a 10 week window um, in which to uh, make a grant application. And, and if you are not prepared with a project or ideas of what you want to do, then you have to kind of come up with that idea. Um, you need cost estimates, so you have to kind of scope out the project, come up with a cost for it, um, and, um, you know, get your uh, everything you need for the submission together. And the difficulty uh, in, in many cases for authorities is if you only meet once a month, um, that really limits the time frame in which to accomplish this. So we always recommend um, have like a wish list of things that are like um, not immediate or, or emergency needs, but things like if someone dropped a pile of cash on your desk, what would you do with it? And and um, some of that can just be, um, yeah, we have um, aging generators at our pump stations and we need to replace them in three years. Well, you know, if the money comes along, let's replace them sooner. Um, th those types of things are, they're really ripe for grant opportunities. That's great. And I think what that also does is it speaks again to your value as a consultant, um, as an expert, because if it is a process to go through to to um, to seek and obtain these grants, you can make your clients aware of what that process entails, what the lead time is, what materials are you going to have to have together for us to be able to submit the application on your behalf or you know, however it works. But the point being is that you can help them not be caught off guard or not miss a deadline because they weren't prepared to get, which is essentially money that they could use for their projects and, and to for their improvement. So again, I think it's just a window of where you can create value. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And and in fact, one of the one of the things we encourage um, 
because we have uh, a lot of experience doing the grant applications is for actually um, our team to do the actual submissions um, through DCED's uh, portal. Um, and, and basically, you know, the, the, the con conversely, we could provide the supporting information and someone on the authority staff or the municipal staff can do the work. Um, and, and we're not trying to prevent them from doing it, but we think it streamlines it by just having our group kind of coordinate everything, have it all assembled, and then be able to submit the application on their behalf and, and know that it's complete. Yeah, it's like my daughter right now is looking at colleges, going through the college application process, and there's a lot of these, you know, consultants or people out there that will help you with the SATs to help you get ready for the application process, you know, think through all the different, you know, parts of it. And, you know, when there's millions of people applying to college, just like I'm sure there's many authorities and organizations applying for grants, you know, that streamline, the ability to be streamlined and be prepared and have the right materials and submit on time really does mean everything and, and can really mean a lot of money in this case. And when it comes to grants, all right, lastly, with, you know, regards to grants, Bill, how do grants align with kind of the long-term sustainability and improvement of water and sewer systems that are managed by these municip municipal authorities? Are there any trends emerging or opportunities that you foresee in this area? Well, I don't know that there's um, trends per se. I think the real answer is, as like I said before, um, you know, authorities face a lot of... Um, new mandates in dealing with older aging infrastructure, um, whether it's water main or sewer pipe replacements or tighter standards for um, water supply or wastewater treatment. Um, so you need to always be ready to address that. So if there's other things that are kind of nice to do and really should be done at some point in time, that's where the grant opportunities really come in because then you're not dedicating the funding you need for the things you absolutely have to do for what seems like a good idea or, or something nice to do. Okay. Awesome. All right. So before we let Bill go, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk more about career and professional development. And we're going to ask Bill a few last questions around his career development. All right, we are back with Bill Mallon from Carroll Engineering Corporation. Bill has talked a lot about grants and the whole grant process and working with municipal authorities. Now we're going to switch gears and we're going to put Bill on the civil engineering hot seat and ask him a few last questions about professional development. You ready, Bill? Sure. All right, so are there any specific rituals that you practice every day, whether it's a morning routine or a lunchtime routine or just something that you've done consistently that has contributed to your success? Well, I'd say in my current role, probably not because um, the the day just kind of takes itself um, with managing uh, 20 people in a department plus the grants um, and assisting with uh, company operations. So um, I, I guess the routine is, is just to be ready um, for whatever comes um, on the phone and the email uh, when you sit down at your desk. Um Historically, I'll say, um, you know, really just when I get into the office, kind of sit down and jot down the things that I um, need to address um, and what the priorities are on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, um, you know, based on the on client needs. Um, at, at one point, I probably was representing half a dozen different clients and, you know, they all have their own priorities and you have to kind of figure out um, without favoring one or the other, how you mesh that all in to get it done. And, and not just for myself, but then um, what tasks do you need to push down to other staff members um, to keep the work moving? Yeah, that's great. And I think when you're in a role like yours, that's so reactive in terms of the type of work you do, it is important to have you know, what I like to call MITs or most important tasks, a couple of things on a list that you know you need to get done regardless of how many fires you have to put out today which can kind of help you to, to stay focused. So, so that's great. Yeah. So Bill, in your career, 
<clears throat> has there been a, uh, whether it's been a book or a, an author or a leadership philosophy or framework or something that you've leaned on that's been helpful for you in developing some of your leadership or management skills? So I don't know that there's a real reference. Um, I, I think from, from a leadership and a management standpoint, um, I've tried to observe what others do, um, think about what they're doing, how they handle or treat people and how I want to handle and treat people and try to pull the best aspects out and discard what I think are the, the net negative aspects of things. Um, and, um, now in a, in a management and supervisory role, um, try to think back when, when I'm dealing with um, lesser experienced people, how I'd want to be treated and um, expect if I were still in their position, knowing what I know now, <laughs> 30 years later. So um, not, not, a, not a specific reference. I, personally, I'm not a big um, motivational book reader or speaking thing. Um, I, good or bad, have kind of succeeded on my own observations. Okay. Well, I think that's great. And I think a, a part of that or a, a point from that is that's important to me is you have to be able to evolve, you know, constantly as a leader. So if you see something that might be working, you might want to try it. And if you, if you notice that something's not working, you might want to abandon it, you know, one way or the other. So I think, you know, that really speaks to having a flexible kind of leadership style where you can take in new things and then try them. And I think that that's important for, for all leaders to consider because, you know, we never have, we're never perfect as leaders. We always got to kind of evolve as we go. Yeah, I definitely have found that. Um, the worst thing to happen when you try something new is it doesn't work and then you try something else. Exactly. All right. So Bill, thinking back on some of your managers that you've had over the years and not asking you to name any names, but if you think about some of your favorite managers, what would you say were some of the characteristics of those managers? We're just trying to kind of understand, you know, what makes for great managers and leaders in the, in the consulting engineering world. So I, I think the big thing and one thing I try to do and try to impress on the people working for me is, um, to have a good library of reference for what you're doing, whether it's um, knowing similar projects um, for what you're uh, working on now, references for the technical things you need. Um, you know, when I started, everything was books and we had a huge library of uh, reference information and manufacturer's catalogs with specifications and, and detail information and everything. Um, as well as, you know, basic uh, engineering data, you know, now everybody sits down and they just Google stuff. And if, if you don't have it at your hand, then every time you have to do something, you're just searching for the same thing. So, uh, I try to encourage everybody when they, when they find something good that they want to rely on, you know, keep it handy, whether it's just a, a copy of that file you downloaded or, um, sitting on your bookcase, um, for your next thing. Um, also good representative examples for the work you're doing. Um, as an example, we do lots of uh, sewage pump stations. And when I have someone new working on something, I pull out um, calculations I did 25 years ago and say, here's a good starting example, and then build from that. Um, and I sometimes panic when I can't find it right away because <laughs> I, I don't think I could recreate it um, from scratch uh, at this point. So, uh, things like that, I find are, are really helpful and, um, it, it's great for young engineers, um, how to learn and, and how to master, uh, the work that we do. That's great. And I, I like that a lot because again, it speaks to kind of that adaptive leadership style and making sure that you have what you need to succeed. And really as a civil engineer, I mean, your past projects are your resume. That's your experience. I mean, that's your career. That's really your body of work. So I think it's a really good idea to kind of keep tabs on that and be able to, you know, pull that when it's needed, especially when you're dealing with clients, you're doing interviews for new client projects, right? And you want to show them some of the things that your firm has done in the past. You want to be able to lean on those things. 
All right, Bill, I've got one final question for you. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you've gotten into an elevator with a up and coming civil engineering professional and you had about 30 to 40 seconds with him or her to share some career advice, what would you say to that person? Hmm. I guess I would say um, don't view what you're doing or what's going on in your environment in the short term um, because things can change rapidly, um, especially in our firm. Um, one thing I try to encourage or, or, or tell people, um, new people when I'm interviewing them is, we wanna give everyone as diverse a background as possible. We're not gonna pigeonhole anybody. Um, so if you think you're just doing one thing over and over again, um, it, it's likely to change. And if it doesn't change, don't just sit there and keep you know, accepting what comes down, uh, stand up and say, Hey, um, you know, I'd like to be involved in this, or I'd like to try something new. Or, uh, if you give me another permit application, I'm walking out the door because I just can't stand it anymore. Um, so yeah, definitely, um, keep track of what's your surroundings, what's going on. Um, and, um, don't be afraid to go as far as you want. Um, what I always tell people when I interview them, when, when they come to our firm is the only thing that prevents you from going as far as you want is yourself. Um, and, and if you only want to do one kind of thing, nothing wrong with that. If you want to be the president of the company, then the only thing holding you back is yourself. All right. Great advice. I love that. And and when we conduct our project management training programs here at EMI, we always start the program by saying change will happen on your projects and to your point in your career and your you know roles and responsibilities. So it really is something that we have to be able to adapt to. And I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times what holds us back is some of our own beliefs or some of our own inaction or things that we don't do um, in our career. So Bill Allen, Vice President, Carroll Engineering Corporation. Thank you so much for spending some time with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Where can our listeners kind of connect with you, connect with Carol? What's the best way to do that? So uh, start with uh, our website, carolengineering.com. Uh, tells us everything that's going on at Carroll Engineering. Um, you can get all of our contact information, find out um, our leadership team, Um description of all the services that we provide. All righty. And that's Carol with two R and two L's, carolengineering.com. Bill, thanks again for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Well, Anthony, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed my episode with Bill Mallon. I know that it may not be an overly exciting topic. However, I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you want to be very well-rounded as a civil engineer. And learning about things like this will help you to speak more intelligently to your clients, to your colleagues, to other consultants to really help you drive the most value. Please consider subscribing to our channel here. We do put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.